Welcome to UPAO Wellness Wednesday for July 19th, 2023. Our topic today is emotional wellness. My name is Carla Robinson. I'm the executive director of United Parks as One. I'm here again today with Hajadina Corbin and her special guest. Hajadina is the United Parks as One wellness and well being navigator and is the guide for our wellness journey. Hajadina, last month you helped us deepen our understanding of spiritual wellness. Today we're exploring our second dimension of wellness, emotional wellness. Let's get started. Great morning, everyone, or afternoon, or evening, wherever you're joining us at the time of day. I am so excited about this uh, session that we're having. So I want to bring to mind the um, eight dimensions of wellness that we are going to be moving through. So there's spiritual wellness, emotional, physical, community wellness, environmental, intellectual wellness, occupation, and financial. So we're going to have a conversation today with Miss Regina Finch. Let me tell you a little bit about this very special person in my life. Um, Regina Finch is a licensed clinical social worker with extensive experience in the social service field throughout the Essex and Hudson area. She is the owner of Sankofa Love LLC, a counseling and consulting practice focused on assisting individuals and families create balance and emotional wellness. Her practice also aids organizations towards sustainability and effective program. That's beautiful. That's what I'm talking about. That's what is needed. So we're going to just dive right in. I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Regina a few questions. And when we're looking forward to just having a very nice flowing conversation. So Ms. Regina, what is emotional wellness and what does it look like? Well, thank you so much uh, for having me. Thank you to United Parks as One and thank you, Hajadina, for putting me on the schedule. I'm excited to be here. So um, and talking about this really important topic, emotional wellness. So emotional wellness from the way that I look at it is all about how we are managing and coping with our stressors, but also how we are managing um, and furthering our relationships as well with others. Okay. So, so it did, can you go just a little bit deeper? So what does that look like? Yeah. Did you, did you answer that in, the, in what you were just saying? No, no. So what it looks like coping with stress. So putting it simply, stress is something that we all deal with, regardless of who you are, where you are in your life, there's always going to be some type of stress. Um, you know, it could be just the stress of getting too excited or too happy about something happening. But then there's also the stress of things not going well, things not going as planned, okay. um, you know, unexpected things coming about. Health, health stressors, all these different things. When you're talking about the eight dimensions of wellness, when any one of those dimensions is sort of, mm -hmm. out, of out of whack or skew, um, that can also bring about stress. Okay. Right. And so our emotional wellness, maintaining our emotional wellness means that you have a plan or have developed um, just a blueprint for how you're going to cope or manage stressors as they come, because they will come. OK, thank you. Thank you. So we hear a lot about emotional intelligence. What is it and how is it related to our emotional wellness? Right. So emotional intelligence um, is different, but definitely related to emotional wellness. Overall, emotional intelligence is how we are, our ability to understand our own emotions, mm -hmm. where they came from, why they came um, at a particular time. I always try to help people understand in my work that everyone experiences the full spectrum of human emotion throughout their lifetime. Right. So it's just emotion. So it's ha mad, sad you know, ha sadness, happiness, excitement, fear, worry, doubt, anxiety, mm -hmm. all those things are natural. Um, emotional intelligence requires or helps us to be able to understand, well, why am I feeling angry right now? Or what is this feeling? 
I've done some social skills work with younger children, especially over the course of this past school year. And a lot of that was really just helping them understand what their what emotions are, giving a name to it, being able to understand in first grade or second grade why your heart is beating really fast in a moment or why you feel like balling your mm-hmm. fist up or why your face has gotten really hot, right? To understand, okay, I feel mad. Okay, well, how do you feel it in your body? Even adults, we have to work sometimes to understand that. And then learning, okay, now how is it, how does it naturally come across my anger, my fear, my doubt um, versus how is it that I'd rather it come across? Okay. You know, sometimes it's like, well, I'm so angry that I'm, I feel like exploding violently, but is that really what we as adults want to happen? You know, and so really creating some emotional intelligence for yourself. And even with others, when you see like that coworker who's always stomping around or has a poor attitude, or they're saying things that, why did that lady say that to me? Or why did that gentleman talk to me that way? To emotional intelligence gives us some understanding about emotions and where they're coming from and how they influence us and other people. Right. So it's it's a, a the strong part that I'm com- getting out of this is it's really the ability to understand how you're feeling, why you're feeling that way, and then you develop some coping skills to help you work through those things so they don't continue to repeat or escalate. Well, right. To recognize, to have some um, being self-critical about, okay, is this the best way? Am I presenting my best self the way that I am right now? Or what can I do to improve or manage how how I'm portraying my emotions? Manage. Sometimes, mm-hmm. Yeah, sometimes we're just kind of doing what's natural, um, but it could be better. And you might be, like I said, it, sometimes it requires for us to be a, a bit self-critical or just listening. I had someone tell me once that, um, you know, they the employer maybe placed them into some type of um, therapeutic intervention to help them with their anger. Well, that employer has invested in you, number one. And number two, okay, so how did it work out? Because they wanted them to be able to improve their response to stressors on the job. Wonderful. What do you do in your practice? What does a a practice, a a counseling session um, look like? What, What is it that you actually do? So my my practice is counseling and consulting, um, and the counseling component is the part that mostly focuses on the emotional wellness, right? So um, it's all about, so as a clinical social worker, I am trained to focus on assessing, diagnosing, and treating mental illness and emotional challenges, right? As well as behavior disturbances. Because some of these things there, we kind of put them all in the same basket, but they're not necessarily. Not every person who comes to therapy is quote unquote mentally ill. They may just be dealing with an episode of raw emotion that they Mm -hmm. are having a hard time managing on their own. Um, That could be grief. That could be um, post-trauma, right? Not everyone who has experienced trauma has quote unquote PTSD. But a lot of the times when we experience a trauma, we may still need to recover post-trauma, you know, after the event that may have happened. Um, It could just also be a period of time that things are really stressful, a job change, um, a new baby, moving, relocating, all kinds of things can cause us um, stress out of whack. And so we seek support. So in my practice, it's all about supporting people. And then I do this other work to support organizations. So Another question, kind of similar to what we just asked, but a little bit more um, kind of visual looking. What does this therapy process involve? And what happens in a therapy session? Yeah, good question. Thank you. Um, So in general, any kind of therapy, whether it's occupational therapy, physical therapy, mental health therapy, all of it is just to help us heal and to relieve something that's in disorder, right, within our system, um, the human system. So mental health therapy is all about being able to heal or relieve some emotional stressors, right? Um, So in the therapy process, therapy is a process. Um, and so I don't necessarily recommend, sometimes you hear people saying, oh, I went to therapy, um, twice 
or I met with someone at this place once. And so, yeah, I know therapy and it's, it's a process. And so I always encourage people, give yourself the time, um, you know, but give yourself the time, really invest the time into going through a therapy process. So in my practice, um, we offer a free consultation opportunity so people can, um, you know, and it's virtual and in person. I have both opportunities for folks, depending on the time of day that they're available. Um, and they can schedule a consultation, which is, or even over the phone, which is just 20 to 30 minutes to just say what's going on, mm -hmm. um, learn a little bit about each other. So I'm learning about the potential client, the potential client learning about me as a therapist and my approach. Um, the young people call it, oh, a few minutes to catch a vibe, right? They'll say, oh, I just wanted to catch a vibe, see your face. Um, and that's fine too, you know, because you want to identify someone who, as, if you're looking for a therapist, you want to identify someone who you can relate to. Um, and that can be on any spectrum that's in, most important to you as a consumer. Um, so just a, a little asterisk, I use the term consumer in part because my license um, as, an, as a licensed clinical social worker is I am a healthcare provider, but my license as your primary doctor's license and any other, even your massage therapist is provided through the Department of Consumer Affairs. So any of this can be verified through the state of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. We consider our patients and clients consumers of a service. It is a service being provided to you. If you meet someone who is a therapist or a healthcare provider, you should be able to see or access their license, whether it's online or on the wall in their office. And I usually, when people meet me in person, there's a, you can see my little blue license on the wall and see the number there and verify all of that because we have rights. As consumers of a service, you have rights and you are protected um, by laws. There are all kinds of laws governing my work as well. So, um, but what people can expect in a therapy process, again, is to meet someone, um, to be able to decide whether you uh, want to pursue, to continue. So usually at the end of a consultation or the end of first session, I will ask the, the, the client, is this something that you want to continue with? And with what frequency would you like to continue? Usually we start off on a weekly basis. Um, some people, because their schedules are you know, busy and so forth, may choose to do um, every two weeks. Once a month is probably too far off for the beginning part of therapy. If it's just you know later on, people may decide to just do once a month. But usually it starts off on a once a week for 45 minutes to an hour of time. Um, and we would also, in the early parts of therapy, the first couple weeks, excuse me, we would also kind of decide what the goals are. What is it that the individual wants to work on to improve, to explore, right? So it could be that they want to work on or improve their emotional responses to things, or they want to um, work on and improve or understand something that happened to them or something that happened in their life. <clears throat> Could be something way long ago. I've had clients that wanted to talk about things, adults who want to talk about things that happened in their childhood, in their childhood. Um, I've also had people who for a while, um, many people know that I've worked at the Women's Resource Center. And so for a while that was attached, that work was attached to the special victims unit of the North police. And so there were times when I would interface with individuals who were really fresh out of trauma or even in the midst of something happening right then and there. I have a client still today who I met during doing that work. Um, and it was actually on the evening that something catastrophic happened in her life that we first met and the relationship has continued. Um, and so what you can expect is to build a relationship with a professional. Um, you can expect for that person to open up time for you in their schedule as you open up time in your own schedule. Um, they should be responsive to what you are bringing to therapy, what you say you want to work on. And there's something that we as social workers call contracting in the beginning. Um, we decide on goals together. Um, because there's the goals that the person may say that they want to work on. I want to work on my anger. 
But I, as a clinician, may observe some other things within the first few weeks and suggest, hey, do you also, have you noticed this kind of thing or that kind of thing? I noticed that you seem a bit um, nervous during session. Do you feel like you sometimes deal with some anxiety? And can we include that into our goals to, to work on managing feeling nervousness or um assertiveness or self-esteem and that is it, the treatment plan for therapy is always in agreement between the provider and the um and the client it's never just a prescription at least not in the way that I work okay so that's that's a full that's a full session right yeah. it's the full session and I like when you um said how you look at the client wants, but you also notice other things or, or when you do that, and this is kind of not on the, off the questions, but when you do that, are, do you find that people are receptive to what you pick up that they may not see? Um, it varies from person to person, but we learn to be, you know, to be reasonably delicate and to figure out my job as, as the as a therapist who's managing the session, mm -hmm. um, is I learn to be re um, delicate and and you know when bringing those things about and really kind of pick up on the cues that the client is giving me. Mm -hmm. It may not be appropriate for to talk about very early. You may need to first build a, a rapport with okay. that person so that they understand the way that you communicate. You understand the way that they communicate, mm -hmm. and by you know, and other things before you just start poking at people and criticizing them. Um, I try to be, you know, like I said, very delicate with folks. Okay. So it may not come about there. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, I was encountering, you know, I've worked a lot with with women. Um, I also now work with a full spectrum of clients. But um, there was a time when I was working with someone who was actually in an abusive situation at home with their someone they were in relationship with um but sometimes we have to understand that language you know the power of language and so we're communicating and we're talking things through dealing with problems you know and trying to help the client sort through the problems but I had to be very delicate about when to use some of that language mm -hmm. I never used the, the term abuse and there okay. came a lot of time where the client the, themselves asked me, do you think that so-and-so is abusive? So now that language has now come from the client's mouth, which means that their mind is ready to understand it. And maybe there was what we call pre-contemplation beforehand about that. So they thought about it at home or they thought about it on the drive-in or they thought about it in their, in their quiet time. And then they decided to bring it here, right? So now that you've opened the space, I can we can respond and talk about those questions. Yeah. That's that delicate piece you talked about, right? Absolutely. And <laughs> yeah. Again, Absolutely. person to person, it could take some time to yeah. get to the the light bulb or get to that. Those kind of pivotal moments can take yeah. time. Thank you. What's the difference between talking to a therapist and talking to a friend who gives you good advice? Because this happens all the time. Yes. So therapy is not. One difference is that therapy is not advice necessarily. Mm -hmm. It's not advice. It is. Um, so yes, I'm always excited when someone shares that they have a friend who gives great advice. You know, it, that should be, you should have friends who listen to you and maybe even offer you great advice, but therapy is not just advice. Therapy is, um, is work. It's work and you're doing most of the work. The therapist is just here to support, to provide perspective, um, maybe even just to mirror some, some of what it is that's being discussed. You know, we, we do a lot of, of reflecting. We as therapists do a lot of just reflecting what the client said or reframing certain things. So you may, so you as a consumer may see, um, may talk about something in a relationship or something that happened in your work life or something that's happening um, or that you're understanding in one way. And then as a therapist, I may repeat what you said. Um, I may provide some perspective or what we call reframe and say, well, okay. Like you may say my, my child, for example, oh, I'm having such a hard time with my son or daughter. Um, they're just being so disobedient. 
I may say, okay, well, describe what you mean by disobedient, mm -hmm. you know, because language, again, has connotations, right? So describe what you mean by disobedient. Oh, well, they always want to have things their own way. They insist on, um, you know, taking the long way or doing things or that. And then it's like, okay, so what you're saying is that your child is, um, they sound very intelligent, they also sound very independent. Um, to just give you some perspective, it's not a forced change, like you should change the way you're thinking about that, but here's some perspective, you know, how, and then we can figure out what's a better way to cope or deal with a, a child in your home who has this strong mind of their own, mm -hmm. right? Um, and how to maybe even just like therapists with the client, how to maybe contract with them. Um, and make some agreements or create a process so that parent and child are not constantly at odds, which can be really tough. Right. Because, so the, because the disobedience may be an outlet for something else. Exactly. It could be yeah. an outlet for, like you said, the independence. So to get a parent to see that, it may put a pr different perspective on what disobedience may not look like. You know, well, right. And then uh, even in that situation, figuring out if there's any, you know, what are the other things going on mm -hmm. right, within that relationship, within the home, within the life of the child, within mm -hmm. the life of the parent, for mm -hmm. example, that are placing this, making this challenge as big or as complicated as it seems. Because mm -hmm. it might just be that they y'all need to take some time to talk about something that your kid wants to talk about that you're avoiding. Right. You know, whatever right. You I, I like how you said that um counseling or therapy is not advice as talking to a friend is mainly giving they give advice and not necessarily the support or expertise that a therapist would give to you I like that yeah I don't um tell my clients what to do unless they're asking me what I think they should do mm -hmm. um most of the time we're just exploring things and topics and you know, talking about them in a multifaceted way to figure out how we're looking at it. Um, and then I will ask the client, so what do you think you're going to do? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and just figuring out how that's going to work. But I don't tell my clients what to do because as a social worker, also we have these, um, you know, we have a code of ethics that we are supposed to abide by. And one of those things, which a, a lot of professionals believe in, is to protect the individual's right to self-determination, which means that what you want is the most important thought in the room. Right. Okay. <laughs> and so even if, if you're an adult, a, a young person, a, a, a little kid, whatever, a, the individual will do what it is that they are choosing. And my job is to protect that. So even, um, you know, if you want to do something that I may see as harmful, it's my job to sort of psychoeducate you on why that might be harmful or what the risks are. And we can have a conversation about those things, but individual is going to do what they choose to do. And that might even be to quit therapy, unfortunately. Yeah. And I'm okay with the individual's right to choose. So um, what, are, what are some of the myths that a lot of people have about therapy? And how do you dispel them? Yeah. Um, well, one idea that a lot of people have about therapy is that therapy is for a special kind of people. You know, that it's um, that it's only for people who have major mental disease or delusion or something like that. Mm -hmm. Quote unquote crazy people. Right. I was just going to say that word crazy. Yeah. And and that's not necessarily a word that that we that I as a professional try to use very much but it is something that you know people think that it's just for people who have this major disorder and um there are I have colleagues who work with individuals who have what we call flight of ideas um in other words they're thinking things that are not reality based um on a regular basis I've worked in the past with individuals who were homeless and so some people who um who live outside, for example, um, they are not always well mentally, right? Not always unwell either, but not always well. And so, um, but that's not the average person who goes to therapy. Mm -hmm. It's okay for average people to go to therapy is the point. Um, therapy is just 
an opportunity to discuss with someone who will be objective and supportive. Um, it should be a, a different relationship than any of your other relationships, the way that it ebbs and flows. Um, you know, and I'm saying ebb and flow, but usually therapy happens at an arranged time uh, for a range period of time. And, you know, if it's every Tuesday or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so that's one myth is that therapy is only for people who are quote unquote crazy or in some type of crisis. It is for them as well, but it's also for everyday people dealing with regular stress or, um, you know, just my emotions are, I'm having a hard time figuring this out. Someone may go to therapy for long term. They may keep a relationship with a therapist for years at a time. And some person, someone may just deal with do therapy mm -hmm. to help them um, explore one thing or manage something else or to understand something that happened. And it'll go on for just a few months. Or, you know, it really just depends on the person and the challenge. So that's one thing. Um, another thing is that the people think, and which is close to the same, that there must be something really wrong if you went to therapy. So we kind of explored that already. Um, and then I think that the idea that therapy is just advice is also kind of removes the um, professionalism of the work. Hmm. So this is my profession. And so I think that's why I kind of stand on the fact that your therapist is not your friends. Your friends are not therapists. You also don't um, to be... Hopefully people don't think that it's indelicate for me to say that as a professional, the work I do in therapy is also not free. Like the work that we, you know, the conversations we have with our friends, it's something that you contract for and you, you have to, you know, people pay for. And now in some sense, um, it may be through a system that it's covered and so forth, but this is our work. It's something that we've actually trained to do. So I, for example, as a therapist, um, I, like I said, I'm a clinical social worker. I went to school for this. I passed two different exams. I did hours of, I mean, two years of apprenticeship under another black social worker, actually two of them were awesome in New Jersey, my mentors. So I studied under them. They coached me through learning how to support individuals um, and families through crises and, and challenges. And then on top of that, um, you know, just trying to build a business. That therapy is a business too. It's not just, oh, I met this lady and we had a good conversation. It's, it's a business. But any other like things that you all have heard as far as myths that you feel like we should try and challenge? I, I don't, but just that one, th that you're crazy. That something has to be wrong with you if you're going to a therapist. The yeah. other thing, which is a little separate question, but still not in line with this, for dispelling the the myths behind therapy, do you feel that since s seemingly more and more companies are opening up to paying for, yes. for um, you know, providing that service? Because if most people look on the back of their insurance card, there's a counseling number that they can call. Do you think that helps with dispelling the myth that you know? You're, you're crazy if you um, go to a, a therapist, do you find more and more companies are opening that up? Yeah, no, that's really definitely a good point that you're bringing up, Pajadina, that, um, you know, that at one point folks were kind of thinking, um, especially within the black and brown community, that it was also something that wasn't necessarily accessible mm -hmm. to people of all swaths, right? And so what has come about especially in the last few years, probably in the last 10 years, but especially post-COVID too, um, is that there are a lot of employee assistance programs that have grown and gotten, um, you know, they existed, but now agencies are like putting it out there, like, hey, if you're having any emotional distress, mm -hmm. any um, overwhelming, you know, stress, just reach out, call this number, so forth. I know at this point, I have some people um, through FedEx who have their employee assistance program and even if they're part-time you know sometimes it was a thing that like you had to be full-time fully vested and all of that no even if you're just part-time you can sign up for this program and get six to eight sessions of therapy okay. and identify a provider you know 
at, of your choosing for that, which is really great. And, and it's the company will pay for it. So yes, there are more of those things. Um, there are more um, people, I think more people are aware now of mental health as a as something to be concerned with. Um, the federal government definitely is. They established a three um, a three character number for emotional crisis nine eight eight, and that was just established um, like nine one one, but it was established by the by the federal um, communication commission just this year in twenty twenty three. So <clears throat> we're just really trying to make you know, make things available to people widely so that folks can really get a hold of their emotional selves and not fall into crisis. It's all about prevention. That's that's wonderful. I, I hope that that is, you know, having having more employers doing that, that it will dispel some of those myths because it is a service that is definitely needed, definitely needed. Um, what advice, and this is our last question, what advice do you have for people who want to improve their emotional wellness? That's a really good question. And I had to kind of think about just the general advice for people because we all are emotional, right? And that doesn't mean that, oh, it's out of control. You're always crying, et cetera. I mean that just as much as we are, um, you know, heart beating and lungs breathing, we are all, you know, thinking people and we experience, like I said earlier, the full spectrum of emotion across our lives, right? So in general, I think, again, that part about being somewhat self-critical, take a look at yourself, you know, mm -hmm. at what and what's happening, what happened in your conversation with your aunt, what happened in your, you know, time with your partner, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and figure out, create a vision for what you want it to be like. Right. So I say some three things to remember when you're trying to improve your emotional wellness. Number one, take time for yourself. So making time for yourself a priority, whether it's every morning for for a half an hour or 10 minutes, if you're busy or every evening, you know, just or however often taking some time for some people, that's a long bath. Other people, that's a journal time. For some people, it's reading your favorite book or spiritual guidance documents, whatever, right? Taking time for yourself. Number two, create a vision for yourself. That visioning, right? Um, even as adults who might be in our careers, I got, you know, my my IRA and my 401k, everything's organized, blah, 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 blah. Great. But you still can visualize something new, something better, something exciting. Um, but creating a vision for yourself, set a goal, just one, even if it's just one. This week, I want to do better at, I don't know, whatever it is. Um, so create a vision for yourself. And the last one is to not be afraid to seek support. So seeking support for to, to get to your vision, right? So that could be professional support from a therapist, from a physical therapist, from whatever, um, but it also could be like where you have to just put your friends and your family on notice. Hey, just so everybody knows, I'm really trying to work on my anger, right? I have a um, someone that I've worked with who manages an, an organization and they're actually with me for therapy. Um, and so we talk all the time about creating boundaries with their staff. And part of that is seeking support. So, and that fits in the realm of seeking support. So it might be that, okay, you know, in, in nonprofits, we believe in having open door policy, right? Well, she has an open door policy. But if you're uh, in charge of things, you don't always have to keep your door open. There could be 10 minutes a day or an hour a day when your door is closed because you need to gather your thoughts or make mm -hmm. write your notes or whatever. And during that time, letting folks know, hey, this is my time. You can leave me a note, you can send me an email, you could text me, and I will get back to you. Seeking support means letting people know what the limits are. Um, for example, with my clients, I try to maintain a 24-hour response time and try to just let people know that, that you may not be able to access me right away. Right. I do correspond with people by text, but I may not respond to you right away. Why? Because I'm a whole person. 
thank the Lord, right? And so I have my own, you know, stuff going mm-hmm. yes, on. Yes. In addition to my work, I have other things that may be happening. And so it could be that, you know, it's a Saturday and you're trying to get your Monday appointment or whatever, but I'm in my life, <laughs> you know? So you got to wait to to respond. But So seeking support and within seeking support is setting um, boundaries, creating boundaries. Thank you. Thank you. I like that. I'm in my life. I'm going to use that. Don't bother me. I'm in my life. My life. <laughs> I'm in my life. So this is, oh my God, this has been such a wonderful conversation. They're all wonderful. I'm so excited to be on this journey with the, our guest and um, having Miss, you know, Miss Carly here as well and honored that United Parks is one is doing, doing this work. I think we need more platforms. I don't believe that people don't want to talk about these things. I just believe that there are not enough people talking about it. So we need we need more platforms like this. Um, so I, a lot of takeaways, um, we're gonna you know decipher this, especially the 988 emotional crisis hotline. I didn't know about that. Um, we're gonna you know make sure you get, get that information. And then your three points, right? The three points to talk, take your self time, create a vision for yourself and don't be afraid to ask for support. Great. Great conversation. So our our next steps, and thank you so much, uh, Regina, for taking the time out of your day to come and talk to us. So for our next Wellness Wednesday post, which is going to be on um, August 16th, we'll address physical wellness as we continue our series about the eight dimensions of wellness, or as I like to say, the eight spaces of wellness, because everybody fills them up differently. Awesome. Thank you both so much. And to anybody else out there, um, if you're a shameless plug, um, if you're looking yeah. for me, my business is Sankofa Love LLC. You can find me on the web at www.sankofa-love.com. Okay. And we're going to post that when we post the, um, the video. So stick around. When we post the video, we will put your um, contact information so that people can get in contact with you because that's why we're doing this because last year we just gave content for everything that we're going to be talking about. Now we want to give people real people that they can connect to for the different wellness spaces and the other topics that we're going to be discussing. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Hajadina. Thank you, Miss Regina. This is really a helpful session and I think it helps unmask some of the um, uh, understanding that people have about therapy. I think you've really brought a lot of that to the forefront and made it yes. easy for people to understand and appreciate. So so thank you. And remember again that our next UPAO Wellness Wednesday video will go up the third Wednesday of next month, which will be August 16th. We post the third Wednesday of each month. In the meantime, be well and take time to enjoy yourself outdoors at a park, playground, garden, or other open space. Thank you. Thank you.